Good morning again, remotely. I wanted to remind all of us again that we're providing this as uh, our effort to give all of us some kind of continuity. It's not right. If you were with us last week and you watched from your home, it was novel, but it wasn't right. We're not here together. You're where you are, and we're here in an empty chapel. We can't hear each other's voices. We can't fellowship together. I hope, if anything, this is making us long to gather together again. But this morning, we do trust the Spirit. We trust the Spirit to work through this service. So as we sing, as we pray, as we all together sit under God's Word, our hope is that even in these difficult circumstances, God will be working in and through you for His glory. Let's prepare our hearts now to worship Him. Together, let us sing the doxology. I hope you're following along with the service that we've provided either on your device or you've printed it out. If you see that there on the bottom of page one, our call to worship is from Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Let's do that as we sing to Him, our God, our help in ages past. This beautiful hymn is well suited both for an introduction to our prayer of adoration and also 
a time to go in and confess our sins. You'll notice there in stanzas five and six are a warning to those who do not recognize God's faithfulness. And how many of us can confess that this morning, that we've not been able to confess and recognize God's faithfulness? I'll lead us in this prayer, and in the midst of this prayer, there'll be a brief time for you to confess your sins to the God who promises to forgive you and His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Triune God, we just sung and celebrated your eternal faithfulness to us, your people. Regardless of our circumstances, our challenges and setbacks, we know that we dwell secure under the shadow of your throne. We claim you as our king this morning. And yet we confess that we are forgetful people. Although we sing and know you are our king, we know that you rule every moment of our lives. We know that nothing falls outside of your reign. We still are a people who panic. We are still a people who give ourselves over to anxious thoughts. We are still people who fight for control and security from the things in this world. Stanzas 5 and 6 of our hymn can both convict and alarm us. We do not want to be the people who are busy about things of the flesh and blood. We do not want to be the kinds of people investing only in life here and now, seeing nothing but the cares of this world filling our vision. Forgive us where we have. Redirect our hearts back to you in our silent prayer of confession. Father, Son, and Spirit, we are getting ready to hear the words of your word from Psalm 66, that right there we have promises. We're getting ready to remember again that Jesus Christ is our only comfort in life and death. We're getting ready to sing that you are the one who stills our souls. You are the one who bears us up. Make these truths so real and practical to us this morning, I pray, and in the days to come. And we depend upon your spirit for that ministry. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Psalm 66. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Praise God. Good morning and greetings to you all. It is a tremendous privilege for me this morning to lead us in our confession. And in just a moment, we will join together and declare what is our only comfort in life and death. But before we do, I would like to think for a minute about the word comfort. We hear this word often in our current circumstances. And people are in need of comfort. But not comfort as in ease of life, but true, genuine comfort. As I was preparing for this morning, I was reflecting on ways that I have seen others comforted and how I have been comforted myself. For my daughter, Adeline, comfort has come in the form of a pink and white blanket. She was given this blanket as an infant, and she still has it as a 13-year-old today. While she no longer carries it with her wherever she goes, that blanket has gotten her through a lot of life. There was no leaving the house without this blanket, and there was definitely no sleep without it either. It was something certain for a little girl in a world of uncertainty. I remember as a child, three or four years old, my dad showed me my pacifier. Now, apparently when my parents took it away from me as a baby, I had no problem. One day it was there, and the next it was gone, and I was fine. But when my dad showed me that pacifier again, I grabbed it and ran. He eventually found me behind the front door, and to this day, I have no idea why I took it. I hadn't even thought about that pacifier, but just the sight of it, the sight of that pacifier stirred in me an old memory, a memory of comfort. Comfort for many of us might have been a, re- a meal someone brought to us in a time of grief, or a simple phone call, or letter, or even a text. Maybe you remember singing hymns with your family as a child. And in those more stressful moments in life, those words and those tunes rush back to your mind. 
God has provided so many means of comfort for each of us. Paul talks about this comfort in Philippians when he thanks them for their concern and care, closing his letter by reminding them that God will supply every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And this is what the Heidelberg Catechism is inviting us to remember today. We all have blankets or pacifiers, and it's completely normal. In fact, it is human to want to be comforted. But more times than most of us care to admit, we find ourselves looking for comfort in places that will never truly comfort us. And that is why this morning's confession is so timely. The Heidelberg reminds us what is our only comfort. Let me say that again. What is our only comfort in life and death? Well, as children of the one true God, we are comforted by the fact that we belong completely, body and soul, to Jesus Christ, our Savior. And our comfort came at a high price, the precious blood of our Savior. Christ's blood rescued us from all our sins, set us free from the tyranny of the devil, reminding us constantly that not even a hair from our heads can fall apart from the will of our Father. Be comforted, my brothers and sisters. He is working all things for our good and His glory. The longer that we remain apart from each other in body, the temptation to grow weary increases. But may these words like I feel like a warm, clean blanket. May they draw us back to the only true comfort any of us can ever know. And I am longing for the day when we can all join together again, looking eye to eye, hearing the unique sounds of our voices, and encouraging one another together as we confess in unison. And may the Lord use this time to draw our gaze and our minds to our eternal home and to our covenant-keeping God. So I will read the question, if you will please respond with the bold. Christians, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death, that my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to Him, Christ, by His Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Amen. Justice, thank you so much. Together, let's sing, Be Still, My Soul. And all is dark and in 
been encouraged, I hope, with the truths that we've sung and that we've prayed and that we've confessed. Now we get to turn to the truth of God's Word. The first passage we're going to be looking at, and I hope you have your Bibles where you are, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. In many ways, Isaiah's life has been paralleled by Paul's life. In this morning's passage, we'll see that Isaiah is confronted with the holiness and beauty of God, and from that, he's commissioned as a prophet. And God warns him that in his providence there will be some that he will speak to who will not hear. We'll see the same thing this morning in Paul's life. As we remind ourselves each and every week, whether we're here or remotely, this is God's inerrant and fallible word. His spirit has already been at work in you. Let's trust his spirit now. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robes filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And he said, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their eyes heavy, And blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Now let's go together, please, to Acts chapter 28. If you're looking at the order of service on your device, you've printed it out, you'll see that it's printed for you there at the bottom of page 5, continuing on to page 6. We're going to look at Acts 28, verses 11 through 31. Again, God's inerrant, infallible word. After Paul and his fellow seafaring partners are leaving the island of Malta, Luke picks up the story. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they had heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself 
with the soldier who guarded him. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect we know that everywhere it is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him in his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's hearts has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is the word of God. Amen. Let me pray for us. God, we do thank you for this word. We thank you as we do week in and week out for your servant, Luke. We thank you for the detail that you inspired him to give to us, both in his gospel and in the book of Acts. We pray for the ministry of your word to us now this morning by your spirit in our separate locations. We know you're not limited by where we are. You are already at work. You have already prepared us to receive this. So now let us rest and depend upon you for that work. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we are at the end of our almost three years' work in Luke's two volumes, his gospel and the book of Acts. We started in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, in September of 2017. And here we are, the last Sunday in March in 2020, concluding. Now, who would have guessed three years ago we would be concluding in this way, that we would be worshiping from our homes and watching and listening to this on YouTube, of all things. And yet here we are, and there you are. The world is shut down. And that's because God has providentially determined that it would be this way, that you would be there. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. As we conclude our time in Acts, I want us to think about the providence and the promise of God. What do we mean when we think about God's providence or when we talk about God's providence? It was R.C. Sproul who said, if there is one maverick molecule in the universe, then God is not sovereign. And if God is not sovereign, then God is not God. Sovereign and providence are interchangeable here. They're synonyms. And what he meant by maverick molecule is simply that if there is one molecule that falls outside of God's providence or sovereignty, then we have to conclude, therefore, that God is not sovereign. And God, therefore, is not God. So to know God is to recognize his sovereign providence. He rules over every single molecule every single moment of every single day, just as he rules over every single step that we take. Listen to the Heidelberg Catechism. This is question and answer 27, dealing specifically with God's providence. The question is this, what do you understand by the providence of God? The answer, the Almighty, everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand, 
upholds heaven and earth with all creatures, and so governs, now get this list, the herb and the grass, the rain and the drought, the fruitful years and the barren years, all meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty. Indeed, it reads, all things come not by chance, but by God's fatherly hand. Now, I want us to lay that truth over Paul's experience in this morning's passage, but even previous. And then I want us to think together about that truth laid over our own experience. To begin, we're going to think about uh, Paul's imprisonment, his beatings, the plots to murder him, the storms, the shipwreck, the snake bite, and understand that it all comes from God's fatherly hand. And it's all happened previous to our passage. So we want to at least provide this presupposition. We want to admit this together. The truth of God's providence and promise lays underneath our passage this morning just as it lays underneath our lives. Let's take a look. We're just going to divide our passage in two parts. First, the journey to Rome, verses 11 through 16, and then the arrival in Rome, verses 17 through 31. Just an easy uh, separation there, nothing real profound, but that will help us make our way through the passage. The journey to Rome in verses 11 through 16, and the arrival in Rome in verses 17 through 31. First, 11 through 16. Now, again, a little background. Almost three years earlier, immediately after being violently beaten, Paul is chained to a wall in the Roman barracks in Caesarea, and Jesus appears to him. You'll remember this. We've discussed it a number of times. Luke writes about it in Acts chapter 23, verse 11. He tells us there that Jesus stood by Paul. He told him to take courage. He told him not to be afraid because as Paul has been testifying to the facts about Jesus into Jerusalem and the surrounding communities, Jesus says, I promise you will also testify about me in Rome. And it's to that promise that Paul has anchored himself from 2311 on. And from that point forward, what Luke writes down is the progress and the process of how God is going to realize that promise in Paul's life. Luke simply wants us to see how the providence of God weaves throughout Paul's life on the way to realizing Jesus' promise for him. And that's an object lesson for us, isn't it? Understanding how Paul gets from Caesarea to Rome and how God providentially arranged and ruled all of that, realizing the promise. What can we draw from that? This morning we see that there are a few more days at sea ahead of them. The the ship, these 2,276 people were boarding, was a Greek ship from Alexandria under the oversight of twin gods, the sons of the great god Zeus. Their names were Castor and Pollux. Now I think we can pick up, since we've lived in, in Acts for so long, the irony here. Boarding a ship that publicly, explicitly sails under the protection of two false gods I can't help but think that Luke was smirking when he wrote this little detail of God's word, knowing, given all that they've been through, knowing that regardless of what was carved into the wood of the ship, he knew, Luke knew, who was providentially guiding them through the sea to Rome. So verses 11 through 16 is basically Luke's maritime log of the final leg of the trip to Rome, giving details where they docked for how long they stayed at each place when they docked, and with whom they stayed. And it's with that part right there, the with whom part, that the Holy Spirit inspires Luke to write that I want us to take note of for a second. There in verse 14, we hear that in Puteoli they found brothers. So Luke's telling us there are other Christians south of Rome who know of Paul, and they invite them to stay with them. These Christians in Puteoli offer Paul, Aristarchus, and Luke, and perhaps others, their hospitality for a week. And then immediately, the next verse, verse 15, Luke says, there came from Rome other brothers. They're not actually in Rome yet. They docked at what was the harbor of Rome, but there was still a 50-mile or so walk to get to the capital city. And as word leaked out that Rome and the rest had arrived, there were those in Rome that went down to meet them. There were those who traveled from Rome 
to the Forum of Appius. That's 40 miles south of Rome. So they're meeting Paul just about halfway. Some stop there. A few others continue their trek to go to the place where Luke tells us the three taverns, about 10 miles further south. So as Paul and Luke and Aristarchus and the rest are making their way up to Rome, they are given the hospitality of the Christians in Puteoli, and then they are greeted before they arrive in Rome by these other believers. And look at what Luke says Paul's response was to this. He thanked God when he saw those who came to meet him, and he took courage. Now let's consider that for a minute. What do you think it was about the hospitality of those in Puteoli and those from Rome walking to meet Paul and the others halfway? What do you think it is about those things, Paul seeing those people, Paul receiving that hospitality that caused in him a heart of gratitude and enabled him to become courageous? And this is where I think it's the providence of God that must come into our view to understand it. If you've been with us, you're well acquainted with all the challenges and trials Paul has seen, the beatings, the loss of freedom, the multiple plots to murder him, the lies and the rumors and the false accusations, the traumatic and life-threatening voyage, the sh shipwreck, the snake bite, ministering to all those on Malta who were sick with fever and dysentery. Paul has been through all of it. Why then the gratitude and courage when being with fellow Christians as they land in Italy? See, I think in crucial ways, these people who offered Paul and the others hospitality for a week, and these others who weren't willing to wait in Rome for him to arrive, but were eager to go down and greet him before he arrived, I believe that they are the embodiment, the proof, the affirmation of God's providential promise keeping. Now, try with me to crawl into Paul's mind to see if that makes sense to us. On countless occasions, Paul had, humanly speaking, a thousand reasons to believe that he would indeed never arrive in Rome. Hindrance after hindrance was thrown in his way. Put yourself in his sandals and just think if these thoughts would have resonated with you. What if the Roman magistrates rule against me and find me guilty and sentence me to death? What if these unbelieving Jews actually do succeed in their plots to kill me? What if I'm not able to survive their beatings? What if during this two-week hurricane storm that we're in really is going to destroy our ship and we really are going to die at sea? What if with these others I begin to lose hope? What if indeed these prison guards do kill me and the other prisoners so that we might not escape and they might not be punished? What if we aren't able to find another ship to get ourselves off of the island of Malta and make it to Rome? What if that snake really is poisonous and I am going to swell up and die? What if all this exposure to all of this fever and all of this dysentery that God is using me to heal and the people of Malta infects me and I die? But Paul believed God would get him to Rome, and yet he had every reason not to every circumstance to get to pull him out of that belief. Now in our passage, he has made it. Seeing these fellow believers reminds him again that God is true to his word, that God indeed keeps his promises. Of course, he's grateful when we think about it in those terms. Here he is in his flesh and blood, meeting with, enjoying the hospitality of, hugging and greeting fellow Christians who are there, on the island of Italy, and they too are able to say, God has delivered you. For the last three plus years, he's had reason after reason not to trust God. He's had circumstance after circumstance to bring into his mind doubt, and yet he has trusted God, and God is making true on his promise. The what-ifs for Paul could have been spiritual viruses, robbing him of the truth of God's providence, robbing from him the assurance of God's promises. Confirmation of God's faithfulness is embodied in these believers. Of course he's grateful to God. And Luke says he took courage. What does that mean? Why would seeing these fellow believers instill in Paul courage? Jesus had already told him in Acts 23, take courage, Paul. You're going to testify to me in Rome as you have here in Jerusalem. Well, think about again the what-if mentality. 
Where does that come from? It has to be, at least in part, rooted in fear and anxiousness, right? Think about our current situation, our moment now. What if I get the coronavirus? What if the economy does tank? What if I lose my job? What if I don't get to walk across the stage for graduation? What if my senior trip is canceled? The oxygen that gives these what-ifs life is always going to be some combination of fear and anxiety. The way we try to often address these issues through assurances, they're always rooted in self-sufficiency or dependency in some way, shape, matter, or form. What if I get the virus? Oh, I'm not going to get the virus. I'm going to stay home. I'm going to practice social distancing. I'm going to wash my hands religiously. I won't get the virus. What if the economy tanks? What if I lose my job? I don't think that's going to happen, but if it does, look at the lengths to which the federal government has gone to at least to give you some sense that you're not going to be in financial trouble. When we recognize that our what-ifs are rooted in anxiety or fear, usually faithless anxiety and fear, and further, when we begin to recognize that we're attempting to address those what-ifs with false optimism or some kind of self-sufficiency or how someone is going to be able to do something to help us, I want us to begin to think and maybe even habituate alarm bells going off in our minds, in our hearts. Because think, where is God in those what-ifs? Where is he in your attempts to answer those what-ifs? Where are his promises? How is the deep, rich truth of his providence informing you as you answer those what-ifs? If you're honest with yourself, you're like me. God is absent. The promises are silent. They don't resonate. The truth of his providence that I do believe is tucked away somewhere deep inside of me, undisturbed. So when we recognize the presence of God with us, when we begin to intentionally and deliberately understand and begin to pull in the promises of God for us, when we begin to bathe in and rehearse the truth of his providence over us, get this, those what-ifs begin to be transformed into even-ifs. What-ifs are fueled by and rooted in fear. Even-ifs are rooted in and fueled by faith. And there was a young lady by the name of Abigail Rimmert who wrote a fantastic post talking about this very thing. What if thinking versus even if thinking. She says we sometimes confuse courage with the what ifs. We face a scary or threatening thing like our current situation with the virus. And we begin to ask all the what ifs. And we then begin to answer all of our what ifs to ourselves or to those who are seeking some sense of comfort. And we do so with self-assured optimism. Or we do so with dependence on our ability to control our own homes and who we are hanging out with and the way that we wash our hands. And in all of that, that's wise. But where in that is God's providence? Where in that is our dependence upon Him, recognizing His presence, resting in His promise? She says believers should address their fears with only the faithful words that can be found in the even ifs because those words have to be rooted in the character and promises of God that we by faith believe. That's where Paul's courage is coming from here when Luke says when he saw them, he was grateful and had courage. He was informed by all the difficulties he had experienced to be sure, but understand what faith sounded like to him in those. Even if the Jews try to succeed in their plots, even if the Roman magistrate tries to find me guilty, even if the storms do not relent, even if this battered ship does shipwreck, even if the snake bite does make me swell up, even if we have to stay in Malta, not for three months, but for three years, God will make good on His promises. 
His courage is a testimony to what God has done so far. After all he's been through, he is now seeing face to face, eye to eye, believers in Rome. He is now making his way to Rome. This gratitude and courage is the voice of faith saying, look at what God has done with and for me. Look at what he has brought me through. Of course I've got courage, not because I was able to endure, but because I have a God who makes promises to me and keeps them through his providential rule, even in the midst of all of my difficulties. What can man do to me? What can nature do to me? What can disease do to me? God is faithful. Paul thanked God and took courage because God's people in Italy were the flesh and blood proof that even if, God will see him through. Let's look briefly at his arrival, actually, in the capital city, Rome, 17 through 31. Now, all of these verses is, again, just the realization of the promise Jesus made to Paul back in Caesarea. Paul is now actually living out the promise that Jesus made. He is now testifying in Rome as he did in Jerusalem. Verses 17 through 20, Paul gives us a summary of how he got to where he is. The Jews continue to accuse him. The Romans continue to find charges unworthy of the death penalty. But the unbelieving Jews would not relent, so he finally appealed to Caesar. And that's why he's here in Rome. And it's for this reason, Paul says there in verse 20, that he's asked them to come so that he could speak to them about the hope of Israel. That's Jesus Christ. In verses 21 through 22, these Jews say they have not received any charges against Paul worthy of death, and neither from these Jews who now have accompanied him to Rome on their trip up. So they want to hear from him. What does he think about this sect? And this sect, that's, that's not pejorative necessarily. They call the Pharisees a sect and the Sadducees a sect. They're talking about Christianity, the way, as it's been referred to in Acts. What do you think, Paul, of this sect? And it's in verses 23 through 28 where Paul explicitly lives out now the promise of Jesus. A meeting was called after this initial introduction and many Jews came, presumably not just the Jewish leaders, but many with them. This was an all-day conference, Luke tells us, with only one speaker with two topics, the nature and character of God's kingdom he was going to share with his Jewish friends, perhaps comparing and contrasting God's kingdom to the kingdom of Caesar, and second, that Jesus Christ, the one who came and the one who was crucified, he was the one their scriptures prophesied about. He says, from Genesis to Malachi, the promised one of Israel has come in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's a bridge too far for some of these people. As we've seen throughout Paul's ministry, some of them just didn't want to hear it. And hearing their disagreement, Paul quotes from Isaiah, the passage we read earlier. They will hear the testimony of Jesus, but they will not understand it. They will see the sense that it makes in their Bibles, but they will not recognize it. And finally, Paul ends this one-day conference telling his Jewish audience that this good news that many of them have rejected is now going to all the world, the way the book of Acts started, to all the non-Jews, to the Gentiles, and they indeed will listen. So in God's glorious providence, Paul, with thanksgiving, with courage, with boldness, and finally being unhindered for two years, he was able to live out of Jesus' promise to him, testifying to Jesus in Rome to all who would come and give him a hearing. So we get to see in vibrant technicolor the providence of God worked out in Paul's ministry and life and the crucially and practical importance, the cash value that the providence of God has for me and you now and all the days that he gives us. Do you remember the unhindered joy of the disciples and the others when they heard of the resurrection of Jesus? Why was that? Other than the obvious fact that the one they thought they had lost had now been come, had come back to life. How did they live their lives? These who were closest to Jesus, who ministered with him and ministered on his behalf. How did they live their lives? What? Were the words that they were speaking to him, were they words of faith? They lived their lives in what ifs. Jesus, what if they arrest you? Jesus said they're going to. Jesus, what if they put you on trial? They're going to put me on trial. 
Jesus, what if they execute you? What if they hang you on a tree? Jesus said they're going to do that. On that good Friday, all those who brought all of their what-ifs to him were nowhere to be found. Out of faithless fear, they had scattered. They could not understand, see, hear how in the world God's providence would make this good. Jesus tried to get their eyes to open. He tried to unplug their ears so that they could hear. Even if they arrest me, and they will. Even if they put me on trial, and they're going to. Even if they hang me on the tree, and they're going to do this. Even when they do all of this, even then, I'm going to rise again. But they then didn't have the ears to hear or eyes to see. So they fled out of fear. Because their what-ifs happened. It's in Jesus where we find the ultimate assurances of God's providence and his promise. If we trust him, if we follow him, if by faith we know him, he shuts down all of our what-ifs and he calls us as his people to live gratefully, boldly, courageously, and in an unhindered way in a world that is full of even-ifs. Paul Tripp recently said that all it took was for a single invisible virus to shut down the entire world. Isn't that true? Think about it. Something that is invisible to the naked eye. And yet it's able to spread with such speed across the globe that it wreaks havoc over the entire planet. In God's providence, this too is from his fatherly hand. He's led us into this storm. And by all accounts, it's a storm we're going to need to endure for a while. To think of it another way, he's required that we all set ourselves under house arrest like Paul. And we don't know yet when that's going to end. Why? Why would God our Father in his providence by his fatherly hand put us in this situation? It's a dangerous thing to try to answer that question. Because his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But at least we ought to consider maybe he has given us, each of us individually, as a gift, a chaotic context in which we now can take our own spiritual inventory. Do you trust him even now? In the midst of all that's going on, are you investing in his promises to you? Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear that even this COVID-19 situation and all of the ripple effects that are going to come from it are from our Father's heavenly hand? Maybe one of the purposes of all this is to remind us of His promises and providence and how we ought to be grateful and courageous people even now. A people who can say, even if I get sick, even if I become unemployed, even if he has providentially determined that my years will indeed be barren and not fruitful, even if this virus plots against me and my family, and even if because of it my life becomes shipwrecked, even if the circumstantial storms continue to endure, even if I am tempted to lose hope, even if all of it, Because of God's providence and his promises, I will be grateful and courageous. And I too, like Paul, will do right now what he calls me to do. I'll do it. Not because of some false assurance rooted in my what ifs. Not believing the lie that I can control what's going on and that I can make this thing better. But because I have the assurance of his promises and providence. Because I have been given eyes to see and ears to hear Jesus. Therefore, I can face it all and I can say, even if God rules and his promises are true and he is forever faithful. Let me pray for us. God, I pray that you would continue to bless the reading of this word and the hearing of it to our hearts. That we would indeed take the opportunity to to do spiritual inventory of our own hearts, that you would convict us where we're not trusting you, that you would allow us to see where we're trusting our own strength, our own schemes, our own ways to make good something that's so difficult. 
that we would indeed not be what-if people, that we would so invest in your Father and his promises and his providence that we would boldly, courageously live as even-if people. May we do that for the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Rejoice, the Lord is King. Let's believe that as we sing it. your benediction for this morning. A benediction is simply a blessing. A blessing that's been realized for you now, immediately in Christ Jesus. From 2 Corinthians 13, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. The first one, I just want to refer you to our website, uh, that one page that's talking about our worship services and updates and ways to give. You'll see there uh, particular ways that you can continue to support the church. There's a video that's going to outline that for you. The only thing I want to uh, remind you of that's not printed there on page 7 of the order of service is the Sarnicky family arrived from Florida on Wednesday. So Andrew and Julia and Owen and their family dog are here. They're moved into their house. He begins to work with us on Wednesday, April 1st. We hope to have a proper introduction to you next week and then an even more proper introduction for you when we are able to gather again. Thank God for the Sarnikis. Thank God for the process. Thank God that he is making us whole with this new family. So thank God for him with us. Thank you. Have a wonderful week.